So, oops, that's hi, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Happy to see you here. The ne ne next to last day of the negotiations. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, global cooperation and the possible link to just transitions. There is a, as you may have noticed, there's a flourish in global cooperation suggestions. Uh, but we need also to make them real and make them to work, and that is what we're going to do here. And one of the major things is, of course, that they should also be just. My name is Max Elman. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Lund University from Sweden, and uh, I'll be moderating together with Stefan Lechtenböhmer. Yes, thank you, Max. Uh, warm welcome also from me this afternoon here at COP28. Uh, welcome to our side event that we co-organize with Lund University, Kassel University, where I'm from, Stefan Lechtenböhmer, um, Agora uh, Industrie and Wuppertal Institute. Uh, the colleagues are sitting there. And we will now have two brief introductions with some slides by Frank Peter, director of Agora Industry, sitting over there, and next to him, uh, Lukas Hermwille, um, research group for a lead from Wuppertal Institute. And after that, we will have discussion and time enough for questions and answers um, for in the follow-up. So that's wh where we start. And so please, Frank, the floor is yours, and uh, start to introduce us into the topic of just industrial transition partnerships. Thank you. Kind introduction, Stefan. Uh, let me spend a few more words on myself, on the organization. Um, we are a Berlin Bay think tank that um, originally started off working a lot of ener on energy, but we are now also more and more heading into discussing how industry transformation can be happening. And uh, um, I'm running an organization that is almost 40 people thinking of how to do it quickly on the industry transformation. And I want to present here today a bit, a few slides on, um, as an example on the steel sector, why we think um, cooperation matters and also explain why it is maybe of benefit for also global so south and global north, uh, north countries. Um, well, I was asked quite a couple of times already if you would have just one thought that should stick from this COP um, out of your mouth, what would it be? And for me, it's quite easy to answer that question. For me, everybody should take away that heavy industry is not hard to abate anymore. We know how it can be done. The technologies, the policies are there, and we just need to initiate it. And I want to take now the example of the steel sector to explain a bit more how this could look like and also what the impact on climate could be. So the global steel sector, one of the most prominent hard to abate sectors being discussed, has, from our perspective, clearly the potential to become fast to abate. We think that a globally net zero steel sector is already possible in the mid of the 2040s. Others say in our organization at the beginning of the 40s. How can this be done? We have in the steel sector, basically in the next 10 years, 60% of the world blast furnace capacity coming online to be relined, where you have a point in time to take a decision what way to go with your steel manufacturing capacity. The impact on the climate if we could accelerate the transformation in the steel sector, could not be underestimated. As shown here in the picture behind me, 40 gigatons of carbon could be saved over the course of the next three decades if we manage to accelerate the transformation in the steel sector. And the key technology we are seeing here going forward is, of course, hydrogen-based steel making. Um, you are seeing a lot of projects being announced as of now, but it must be more to be effective and also take the course to stay well below uh, two degrees. And another thing that one must keep in mind, a sector like steel could also provide potentially much needed negative emissions to keep the 1.5 target and reach going forward. This is also a dimension we have discussed in our study going forward. 
So what would it really take to drive the ambition in the steel sector? We have shown here on the picture um, HBI production, which means hot briquetted iron that is made out of high quality iron ore and uh, hydrogen together. And the green iron trade internationally to ramp this up is from our point of view a key element to get the acceleration going. And also an element to save costs in the transformation, as Max just mentioned, we also want to have a just transition, and the key element of a just transition is to keep the costs as low as possible. For us, the green iron case, as we describe it here, offer the opportunity to combine very well suited renewable production sites with the potential of the availability of ore, high quality ore going forward, and this would lead to the point that per kilogram of hydrogen, you could get in at the cost of $1.5 included in the intermediate product of sponge iron, also called HBI. If you compare this with traditional strong steel markets and the production costs of HBI in those regions, for example, Germany, Japan, maybe also China, you see that hydrogen production costs there are much higher also the idea to bring hydrogen in an, in an elementary form to those markets via seaborne transport, for example, would add substantial costs. If you look at the bar that shines green, so the seaborne hydrogen costs uh, for transporting it are at least double the production costs at the lowest sites of hydrogen production today. And this is where we see here comes the big advantage of embed hydrogen just in an intermediate product like HBI and transport it as mass freight good like we do it with ore and others um, over the cates for now. So the HBI trade really could advance things quickly, but it needs um, some sort of international collaboration. I will come back later to the point. We have in that sense a lot of, we call it here, displayed in green opportunity countries in place where we have this magic match of cheap renewable potentials, low cost hydrogen in the end, and also the basic material source, for example, iron ore. Those countries are Brazil, South Africa, Australia, Canada, maybe also Ukraine play a role can play a role in that. And you have on the other side, the big markets of import of the ingredients for steel production, which are today ore and metallurgical coal. You can look at the European market to China, South Korea, Japan, maybe also Taiwan need to be mentioned. And only if we match to bring together those potentials of the opportunity countries and the big demand markets for steel making today, we can achieve this fast transformation going forward. And well, here's the reason why cooperation matters. This is not yet done. We have nothing in place yet in the international sphere that gets us going on that end. When looking more generally at the industry transformation, you always have to address the whole value chain of it. What does it mean? You need upstream to bring green energy, green feedstocks to, to production facilities, namely hydrogen or bio-based um, carbon in the sense or in, in the case of steel making. You need at a second step, turn over your traditional production facilities. So the hydrogen-based steel making runs on a different process compared to what is the dominant technology today, the BF buff route, the blast furnace-based integrated steam making route needs to be replaced for that. And for that, you need, for example, innovation funding or OPEX funding because the hydrogen costs, at least in the beginning, in the starting phase of this, may be higher than what you have at operational costs in the BF buff route. And you need, as a third step, 
to downstream create a demand for green products. If this demand is created, it could create a market pull factor that really goes in the direction that companies build confidence in investing in green iron and steel making going forward. You could also replace here the name iron and steel making by fertilizer production or by high value chemicals, ETC. You see that here we have quite a complex structure how this um, transformation must be organized globally. And it starts from the very early beginning when aligning on sustainability criteria for green hydrogen or biomass or the definition of green steel or the architecture and ruling how embodied carbon is measured where international cooperation at a minimum level is required to keep this internationally traded commodity live and accessible from all markets from all, and all accessible for all market participants going forward. So to have something that holds something like a structure where you can at least agree on the minimum standards that are needed to drive this change would massively help investors globally to take the next steps and going forward. With, with that, um, I want to once more keep in your mind, really it's time to remove the hard to abate label from steel at least, but you also can do it internally for fertilizer production, for cement. We have them all available, the technologies that are required to go that way. We have the costs also, I would say, in check, because usually it adds just a fraction of the end use costs where those materials end up in. And we have now to organize the speed and the scale to get this going to deliver on fighting climate change going forward. So what we are really require here now is getting to unlock the implementation. And we think the coordination aspects in that sense are crucial to get this unlocking going. And with that, I hand back over to the moderator. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Frank. Very impressive. Uh, we really can do it. And now we move over to Lucas, who will show us what we are actually doing in international cooperation. And I will also try to quickly shift the slides. But Lucas, please yes. go ahead. Uh, can you? Yeah. You can hear me now. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Lukas Hamvel. I'm a senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute. It's an applied research institute in Germany focusing on sustainability questions. And uh, I have been working on both ends, or all ends, I think, of this, uh, th this team of this today's show. We've, I, I, I live in the Rhenish mining area in Germany that is currently undergoing a just transition process. I have been working on global climate governance uh, a lot. This is, uh, I think, my 10th COP that I attend. And I'm increasingly looking into industrial transformations. And um, what we have, uh, is the slide already? The slide, slide is already on. When but I don't. One. Yeah. Ah, yeah, OK. Um, it's not on our screen, but that's fine. Um, so thanks for your introduction of what we need, and it's not as if we don't have any form of international cooperation, international governance for energy intensive industries. This is a result from colleagues Simon Otto and Sebastian Oberture in our joint NDC Aspects research project in which they surveyed the global governance landscape of all the institutions that are and initiatives that are already active in the space. So obviously we have the UN Framework Convention, the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, but as you know, this is just setting the, the, the very overarching headlines for industry transformation. It's not going into details. We did have some discussions about a decade ago about sectoral approaches, uh, but this, this has stalled and has not been picked up in the, la in, in the past. Just in the last one, two years with the global stock take and the uh, mitigation work program, there was some um, 
some push from some parties to increasingly look into sectoral transformations, but this is really still uh, yeah, uh, a nascent development when we come to the climate negotiations. There are a lot of other relevant institutions here, both um, institutions that are intergovernmental between national governments, but also transnational governments that uh, include subnational actors and or private actors and we have these hybrid uh, institutions uh, like the Leadership Group for Industry Transition Lead It or the First Movers Coalition, which is, which is basically a private sector organization or initiative to create uh, a market, create demand or pool demand for uh, green materials, steel and cement first and foremost. In our analysis, we have um, looked on governance providing six governance functions. Yeah? Uh, global governance can provide guidance and signal which affects the decision making, the investment decisions of stakeholders, of uh, industry leaders, of policy makers on, on all governance levels. Um, we can obviously set rules and standards uh, from theoretically joint carbon markets, uh, carbon pricing instruments to technical standards and definitions for green steel. Uh, we need transparency and ac accountability, first and foremost, to get the trust to actually be able to adopt decisions on rules and standards, and then to also be able to enforce those. Um, we need means of implementation. I think that you are all aware of this, uh, in this in this space, how important um, climate finance, but also um, technological transfer and capacity building are for advancing transformations. And we have shared knowledge and learning. And finally, uh, with this, yeah, this, this mushrooming of new initiatives and governance institutions, we also need some sort of orchestration, organization, networking between those initiatives to uh, not duplicate each other's work and make sure that we have a proper div uh, uh, division of labor, labor among them. <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, and, and if you look at the, the existing work, we do have some general decarbonization goals, maybe we get a, a, a refinement and, and further operationalization of those here at this COP, when parties, should parties decide to fossil, uh, phase out fossil fuels. Um, but we do have some sectoral industry vision pathways, but these are at least not very well uh, politically anchored, so there are a lot of institutions who have been working on those, but mostly on a technical level, not so much on a political level. Um, on rules and standards, there is actually uh, a large number of initiatives who are trying, working on defining what green steel and how, how green steel and how green cement should be um, defined and what the, the uh, greenhouse gas intensity threshold should be. Um, I think something like 40 now, so the, the, the big challenge is here to consolidate that. Um, there's work on public uh, procurement for green materials already ongoing. Uh, with transparency and ac uh, accountability. This is something that has been um, increased in, in the last few years, but still we, we don't know a lot about the details of um, uh, carbon intensities of steel products in many parts of the world. Means of implementation I talked about is, is still lacking. And knowledge and learning, um, I think about the technologies, you're absolutely right, we know much of it. Uh, maybe that knowledge has to be diffused more. And most importantly, I think we do need a lot of knowledge and learning about policies and getting the, the, the politics right uh, in advancing these. The, the major gaps that we see is that we, yeah, we lack a harmonization of standards. Um, there is, like, as long as we don't have standards for green materials, it's also hard to establish uh, um, actual markets for them because if you can't certify a product, uh, it's, it's really hard to find the buyer who is willing to uh, yeah, take the risk of having a slightly greenish tinted uh, steel or not. Um, and obviously we do not have rules on competition and carbon, uh, carbon leakage. The, the original idea of uh, climate clubs to, to uh, entice a global carbon market or, or a carbon market among peers that are club members, we are far from that, but I don't think it's actually attainable in the short term. Um, we do need a lot of uh, more finance um, and technology devol development. I think you had it on your slide. We also need a lot of um, yeah, ramping up engineering capacity. So the, 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 there are currently only two uh, technology providers that 
um, provide the, the, the core technology for hydrogen-based steel making, and they share 95% of the global market. And they have jointly a, a, a production capacity of two large steel plants per year. But in the early 2030s, if we want to achieve what you have outlined, we, we meet, need more like one per week. So there is a, a huge uh, buildup of engineering capacity that needs to happen, and a huge, um, yeah, we, 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 we will need to get to ways to sharing those uh, technologies and making them, adapting them to different uh, country needs. And finally, with all the, all the, um, yeah, uh, jigsaw of different in, uh, institutions and initiatives, I think there's also a need to coordinate more. I would like to th highlight three very recent developments that were um, basically happening here at COP. Um, um, just to give you an overview of the most recent developments in this. So the leadership group, lead it, uh, leadership group on industry transition uh, made a, a statement between the uh, Prime Minister of Sweden and Narendra Modi of, of India early at this COP to, to reinvigorate this, this uh, initiative. It's a transnational partnership, including countries and companies. It's very much focused on technology, a joint R&D, and some transparency. They run a coal plant tracker, for example, uh, and tra various trackers of progress. Um, but, but what's so far at least lacking is joint investments. Maybe that is happening now in the second phase. Um, to, at least my perception is that the guidance and signal going out from this initiative is relatively low-key, also because it's a relatively small initiative in terms of companies and uh, countries um, involved. And it's really, uh, well, a good starting point for more technology learning and information sharing, but not adequate to really spur and facilitate the kind of large-scale transformation that we need. The Climate Club was fully launched at this COP uh, last week. It uh, currently comprises 35 countries plus the EU. Um, and it is designed as a multilateral political forum with some political weight because it's the favorite uh, initiative of the German can Chancellor and he uses his convening power to bring people on board. Um, it's supposed to work on three pillars. One is advancing transparent policies. This is kind of coming originally from the idea to coordinate carbon pricing policies, but it's going yeah, in a different direction now. It's now about more about improved metrics on measuring uh, uh, intensities, emissions, and, and also progress. And I think at the core, a strategic dialogue to um, exchange views about the risk of carbon leakage and ways to mediate it. Um, it's also supposed to track progress of the club as a whole. Um, and the second pillar, which is, I think, for this panel, perhaps the most relevant one, it's about transforming in, in industries. The club specifically has the goal to, um, yeah, maybe not consolidate the various standards for green steel and green cement, but at, at least work on common understanding and interoperability to pool lead markets and to develop a toolkit for targeted uh, support policies, basically the kind of policy learning that I talked a lot about. And finally, the third pillar is about international cooperation. It will start out with a ma mapping of initiatives, um, of, of tools and instruments to enable private investments also, and, and a matchmaking platform. Uh, I've been told that this is supposed to be mirroring a little bit of what's in the NDC partnership, uh, basically a vehicle to access climate finance in, in, in the, the uh, developed countries in the world. So again, this is a big improvement, I think, on the transparency, knowledge, and learning, and maybe also some rules and standards, specifically with the definition of green steel. But it did not come with a very bold target providing additional guidance and signal and does not contain fixed roadmaps for, uh, for um, uh, steel decarbonization, cement decarbonization. And most importantly, key players are not on board. Uh, so far, none of the BRICS countries have joined the club despite some efforts from, from the Germans and Chilean presidency of the club to uh, invite them and to con convince them uh, to join it. And finally, you're probably well aware of the concept of the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that has been, I think, invented or, or fir first launched in Glasgow and was a big thing last year as well. It's a plurilateral partnership between developed and developing countries with a long-term perspective and um, that supports developing countries that want to transition away from coal towards clean energy. It's country-led, 
Um, it has significant funding attached, although that's um, a lot of it that is very conditional, and there have been some, uh, yeah, conflict and, and controversies about this when when um, the negotiations actually started and went towards implementation. It has a focus on just transition, which all the others uh, don't, um, and it has been, I think, instrumental to change the discourse at the national level in, in those countries who have started um, and cooperated in jet peace. There were also negotiations ongoing between some countries and India on an uh, in Indian jet peace, which never led to anything tangible. Um, so there, there, there was perhaps some resistance. We can talk about this with our Indian colleagues. Um, so we don't have a jet peace for India. We don't have one for Brazil and many other countries. And obviously, uh, one drawback is that they so far are exclusively focus on, um, on energy and we want to talk about industry transformation. So here we are uh, basically asking the question whether we could adapt this, this tool to use it as a way to also facilitate and advance the uh, negotiate, oh, not the negotiations, the transformation, to facilitate the transformation of the industry sector. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, well, Lucas is from Germany, he's pro Climate Club, I'm from Sweden, I'm pro Lead It, so we already have attention here <laughs> for one of the, one of the different uh, corporations. As you saw, he listed, I think it was around 35, and then you in the ended up with orchestration, and then, it's, no, it's, it's a lot of conductors for an orchestra to have that many. But in order to dig deeper into this now, we have actually an excellent panel, and I will begin with uh, Shrestha Banerjee, that is online here. I think you can hear us. Can we hear you? Can you say something? Yeah. We yeah, thank you. I can hear all of you. And I miss being there. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Nice. And you are from... Uh, let me check that this is... Uh, your director in Just Transition in iForest International. Thank you. Sure. And, and it's International Forum for Environment Sustainability Technologies, so short, we call it iForest. And um, just a brief introduction, so I'm heading the Just Transition program at iForest, which essentially has two components, the Just Energy Transition and Industrial Decarbonization, but all with a very, uh, you know, um, justice angle to it. How? So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then we have uh, Rosana Rodriguez Dos Santos from... Sorry? Yes. <laughs> uh, from uh, E Plus Energy Transition Institute. Yes. And then we have Parv Kumat from CSE India. France. Excellent. So. And I think we would start with one major question. Now we've heard a lot of these uh, corporations that exist. And I will go through the panel. You'll have to each think of it. You're all independent, but you also are well aware of what your government thinks. What does your government think of these? I mean, what do they want out of global cooperation? What are the barriers? Exactly, what do they not want to see? I mean, I can see differences. I know India is part of Lead It, not Climate Club. Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe there's a reason. Brazil, I think, is not in anyone so far. <laughs> uh, and so, so just talk us through, give us a couple of insights of how do your government see global cooperation in the hard to abate sectors and what do they want from it and what do they not want to see in it? we we'll begin with Parf. Okay. So, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, I think India is growing uh, very fast and I think this is the decade in which India will be uh, growing further. I think they say that 70% of the country will be built in this coming decade. And for this growth, steel, cement, and such materials are very, very important for the growth of India. So th this is very clear that India would never want to compromise on its growth uh, and, and anything related to the developmental goals of the country. Uh, now, uh, to dev although even with these developmental goals, I think India is also trying to put out its own decarbonization plan they are devising their own decarbonization plan for the industry. Uh, and that is based on the resources available within India. Uh, and that decarbonization plan has a set of challenges. And I think any international cooperation which 
focuses on those challenges, those very deep and focused challenges, I think stands a chance uh, to be in the deal. And I think uh, India is very particular about that because uh, they are very regional and focused challenges of the region. And, uh, and, and these challenges are like uh, alternate raw materials or, or alternate fuels, which are very expensive in India. It, it is about finance because uh, there are sectors and huge transformations, but uh, hardly any money is flowing into hard to abate sectors currently. And, and of, of course, these kind of challenges, and, and India also has a huge uh, small and medium scale sector related to the hard to abate sectors, uh, which, which poses a big challenge. And, uh, and these are the kind of challenges which India would want to look at. I think most of the countries wouldn't want to compromise on their own developmental needs and might be looking at tailor-made uh, options and deals which they can get from uh, at, at the global level. So, and definitely the no-goers would be that uh, they wouldn't want any external targets for emission intensity to be imposed on, on them currently, especially uh, when the growth is at its pace. Uh, so I think that, that is the point of view they are looking at, and that is why probably they have made a tailor-made deal with Sweden. Probably they are interested in certain technologies, and, and I think if there is more clarity that comes up with Climate Club, you never know. I mean, there could be a deal there as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Part. Uh, that was good, uh, an insight on, on the real big challenges which are impressive in India. Uh, but another country which is also big and also I think has a lot of uh, <laughs> important things to say is Brazil. And so uh, I would like uh, to also hand over to Rosana Rodriguez dos Santos. You are working on energy transition for a long time and um, so how do you perceive the Brazilian challenges and position also by your government? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for first for being invited to be here. It's really an honor to talk in such a, a challenging idea, which is the DITP, which I think it's a great way to uh, embrace this idea of energy transition and industrial transformation in a just way. So just uh, going to some perspective, very complicated to talk about how my government thinks, not being a government myself, but we have some perceptions and I think a uh, good way to understand that is in the 80s, the industrial um, the industrial revenue or wealth of Brazil was more or less 40% coming from the industry. Nowadays, it doesn't even reach 10%. So we, uh, after 40 years more or less, we uh, went through a highly and severe process of deindustrialization, meaning that we went back to sell basically only raw materials with little or no, not such uh, added value as it could be. So this chat here on, uh, and especially what Frankie was talking about, um, it was it is something very dear for our our government, meaning that our primary resources are valued the way it should, meaning we are at least this year, for example, 92% renewables in terms of the grid and, and more than 50% renewables in terms of the energy mix. We do have the a high quality iron ore, high quality aluminum, high quality silicon. We do have what it takes so we can help decarbonize the world if the demand is there. And this is the key thing. I think this is the key barrier together with financing that my colleague here brought. Meaning if the world is willing to buy green products, semi-industrialized green product as HBI or any other uh, industrial product, we are ready to move. Brazil has an installed capacity, an industry that is there and it's latent to go. So I would say summarize the barriers and the challenges is first, from our government perspective, is to add value to the Brazilian society and create quality jobs. 
because with the industry, and if we share more or less those supply chains where to where the uh, primary resources are, it's not only good for the emissions, it's also good to share the creation of uh, quality jobs, which is pretty much needed in the world. And the second thing for, for our government, they launched already two plans. One is the ecological transformation plan, which is a, basically a decarbonization plan. It's a full decarbonization plan taking also into account bioeconomy, uh, the bioeconomy and the hard industry and other sectors and, uh, and uh, equit equitable distribution of wealth. And the second thing, it's a, called a new industrialization program. So it has all to do, everything to do with what we are talking here. So this is my first, my first talks, my first thoughts. And um, if I may add this first chat here, one thing. In interna international cooperation, it's much more than capacity building. So capacity building is good, but we do have a lot of capacity and India has a lot of capacity. So we do have to have capacity building, technology, technology interchange, and so on and so forth. But international cooperation is to share the burden of this decarbonization, to shift supply chains to where it, it emits less, and to share also the jobs and the green jobs. This is international cooperation, not only capacity building, as we see all over that the first thing, international cooperation, capacity building, some money to capacity building, and that's it. This is not it. It's good, but it's not it. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, I would put Lucas directly in the spot there. Uh, you, came, you come from the European industrial heartland, and I know what you intellectually think about the opportunity of importing energy intensive uh, intermediate like sponge iron, could be also ammonia whatsoever. What do you think the industry response in Europe and the European Commission is? Can you speculate that? What's the mood? What's the mood in Germany? Yeah, it's, it's uh, um, I think it could go both ways. It could go two ways. On the one hand, um, we have a pretty clear political outlook. Um, the EU emission trading uh, scheme will hit zero at 2038. And in the meantime, the free allowances that, the, that has propped up the industry so far will, will go down even faster. So it's clear the, the, the European steel industry will be green or gone uh, in 15, 20 years. So uh, that's, that's totally clear. Um, so on the one hand, there's a lot of anxiety of uh, taking the, the right bets and investing in the right decisions. Everybody knows still that the current, uh, the first plans and the current prices are not there to compete with imports. That's also why the EU has put up the CBAM as a way to make sure that um, we don't stall our, our own decarbonization. And I think from that point of view, there is a real risk that we end up in a, in a kind of a industrial policy nationalism scenario where everybody wants to prop up their own industries and not share their technologies. But in my view, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. I really don't know whether our pockets are deep enough to sustain this policy on the one hand over the very long time. And I'm also pretty sure that it will lead or it will make it much harder to hit our uh, decarbonization targets globally. So if we don't cooperate, if I think the, the biggest source of new demand for steel will be India. Um, if, we, if we don't manage to decarbonize steel in India, we're not getting there. And I think this, this, uh, this option of importing direct reduced iron um, is, is a way to probably bridge that tension, to uh, make sure that the European steel makers, not the entire value chain goes, only the, the most energy intensive, the most emission intensive part goes, and maybe also not altogether. There will be space for a few DRI plants in Europe, in Sweden, they are being built, and in other places. Um, and also, you could think about seasonality, um, produce a lot of uh, uh, green iron in Europe when it's sunny on, or when it's windy, and in the, in the winter you shut it down for two, three months and import it instead. So there, there, are, there are a lot of options that, that are getting there that which, where I would think uh, 
the European industry is actually benefiting from, and it's 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 their 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 only hope maybe uh, because otherwise the entire value chain uh, will go off. But on the other hand, the industry at the moment they are still trying to get all the investments and all the subsidies they can to to build uh, the the new plants because once you have one, you're kind of in 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 the first mover position. So it's, there is a lot of tension here. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, for giving uh, that part uh, directly to so, that. So, yeah, just wanted to add that uh, making HPI in developing countries and then uh, transporting it to the developed countries, th uh, there has been this issue of low value production in developing countries, and then that moving into finished products, which again becomes a very high, will high value product. And that doesn't sound like a very equitable partnership at, at times. So this has to be kept in mind that whenever such a partnership is forged, uh, it, it has to be very uh, equitable in nature so that uh, both the partners benefit equally in that and uh, why not also think about uh, full production in developing countries and then export to the demand areas as well. So mm -hmm. I know that steel has a lot of variety and that's why it's difficult you know, to have all that variety and compared to iron, yeah. which makes it easier. But yeah, this low value to high value is, has been an issue with manufacturing industries in the past. And maybe in our future partnerships, we can be more careful on that. Yeah, thank you for reminding us. Uh, Lucas, very brief, because now I want to switch over to Shrestha, who is there yes. in India. No, I think uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, the strategy of the German steel makers at least was already to focus on specialty steels, on very high grade steels. And what I, I can imagine is that this will even accelerate and we will import a lot of finished steel products, but construction steel, steels that are not specialty steels for, for cars or other, other high quality uh, um, products, because I think that's also the core uh, competitive advantage of the European steel makers being close to their customers, being able to have those specialty steels. And there's a, a, a lot of room in between, between just in, uh, importing the inputs and just uh, and importing everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add one single word? For us, uh, it's a portfolio of uh, situations. And if you bear in mind that we are the second largest exporter of uh, brute iron ore, um, so, and we are positioning ourselves to export hydrogen, so expor exporting HBI is already a lot better than exporting both of them like it is, but it will be a portfolio, a little bit of HBI, a little bit of construction iron, uh, very quality steel, cars, uh, appliances, and, and everything, so there is a portfolio of things. This is how we see it. So. Yeah, great. Thank you for this very important discussion. And I, uh, now I want uh, to hand over to Swesta Banerjee from iForest. Very happy to have you here directly from India. And, and sorry, it's of course a bit more difficult to intervene in such a lively discussion when you are just on the screen. But Swesta, you heard all the arguments already. And I would like to add one as aspect in question to you. You have been working also regionally. And I think this transition is not only one thing on the big national or European level. In the end, all the steel industries, the cement industries, the coal industries are located locally, and, and that adds to uh, another important dimension. And maybe you could, uh, could give us some insights from your work also from this perspective. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. I, I wish that I could stay back at COP. I just got. Uh, um, so, uh, th you know, the thing that I wanted to highlight here from the regional perspective, but also from the challenges with transitioning of some of the industrial sectors like steel or cement, is that, that it has a lot of income dependence, direct and indirect. And that matters for countries like India, where you are absolutely right that their uh, fossil fuel industries are concentrated. For example, where there is a coal mine, there is also a steel plant very close by or a cement plant or aluminum industry because of easy availability of raw materials and also iron and all, but I'm just telling from the fossil fuel side. Therefore, for example, in a state of Eastern India that we are deeply working on, such as Orissa, it has a cluster. It is a, it's almost an industrial cluster. And therefore, 
one industry going or you know trying to change their pathways affects a value chain and with these industries one of the key challenges is the indirect or workers and the informal workers because they are bound to fall through the cracks and therefore when we talk of transitioning of these industries we really need to be careful how do we deal with the informal workers and indirect workers for example just for the steel sector since you know we have been discussing it there are about 2.6 million workers engaged in the steel industry in india and this is uh, you know industry statistics government statistics put together and out of which only 0.6 million are direct and 2 million are indirect now it therefore indirect is nearly four times and this is the challenge that when we talk of industrial transition which is also just which means that you know workers and local communities and the local economy has to be taken care of then it is more about just technology transfer it should be something more that can be offered to those regions and to those countries now there are two parts to this industrial transition when we are talking of industry you know international cooperation and in the beginning we alluded to that question like why uh, some countries are not is uh, really really not getting into it and particularly india because we know that now senegal has also signed a jcpa and already south africa indonesia vietnam are there and in the, india was the fifth one uh, which was being much talked about now one of the key concerns and it has been largely discussed jcpas in terms of you know coal phase down in india so far but if we look into even you know going beyond just the coal phase down a key concern for india is the costs that just transition will incur given the huge dependence and some of the key costs are of course technology uh, repurposing of these facilities uh, but also related to workforce economic diversification uh, you know capacity building uh, uh, planning support governance all of this and we have done some work with respect to estimating the costs of just coal sector and it is coming to a trillion dollar over the next three decades now if we put on top of that steel sector cement sector all of that it's a huge huge cost for india now when we look into many of the partnerships that are coming into to support an energy transition or a just energy transition we really need to there are two key issues of course one is technology transfer but the biggest one of the thing that is a big impediment for countries you know to take a step is the financing like what will i be giving up and where can i get the money from and how and this how question if we look into the jet piece that has been forged uh, in the last two years a lot of it is through uh, your loans and as lucas mentioned that there are also conditionalities you know tied to the financing which have uh, now uh, set a lot of controversies but nonetheless the question is that therefore the partnership that has to be forged it has to look into definitely technology transfer i agree completely but it also has to come with certain conditions that the workforce and creation of jobs becomes you know can be assured for example for a steel sector transition we need to understand that how this huge number of indirect workers that are related to it which is four times the direct workers how can they be reskilled or reemployed in a green industry because currently they do not have the skills this requires also a lot of assessment studies that needs to be supported now some of it can come through you know knowledge support from uh, internet through international cooperation uh, partnerships etc but i feel that if international cooperation brings in money for technological transfer we need to also see how other money can be matched up to actually deal with some of the just questions that we are talking of uh, and here there is no money so far through international cooperation so uh, this is something that india needs to look into and the you know when we talk of international partnerships we really need to think through because one of the big things and maybe i'll stop to that uh, and uh, you know before the room can discuss further but one of the things that is being discussed in this cop is also a just transition work program 
And uh, what countries have to, we all have this partnership, so we're talking about finance, but now how, how countries will work around it. It depends on countries' priority, it depends on countries' capacity. And therefore, actually just transition to be implemented on ground. We need to understand that it has to also provide for the workers or for the local communities where these transitions will happen. And that is, you know, that's our experiences from subnational work is that unless we can ensure that or provide that kind of assurance, it is going to be a very difficult question. Even if a country agrees to get into it, but you know, if we really go by the inclusive spirit, the local people will not because they don't see what's their future. So therefore, I believe that this kind of things should be really uh, somehow ensured through these partnerships and you know, which can also help, I believe, uh, to have a good just transition work program developed in the next year, I think, which is going to be a big thing uh, after this COP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was very important to understand that the transition of hard to abate or formerly hard to abate, fund to abate sectors is, uh, will affect developing and developed countries quite differently, actually. And I would like to, I mean, and this was the point that it will be a local, very dramatic effect in some countries, could be, uh, whereas, I mean, we have the same kind of transition in Sweden right now, but we do also have the resources to reskill, and our industries are sort of actually not employing that many people anymore because they're quite automated. So I would like to sort of, but this touches upon the heart of the whole question of justice. Is this between countries or within countries? I would like, Rosanna, to begin, what is your view on Brazil? I mean, is there any way within global cooperation you can sign of, kind of help this kind of local transition where maybe also a lot of resistance would come? And could Lucas then also, after that, give, we do have this kind of talk also in Europe, where we do have problems also with justice and transition there as well. Rosanna. So uh, it has a lot to do with our, um, what we said first in our first interventions here. It's a matter of uh, getting out uh, from the role of only exporting semi-raw materials or low industrialized materials to uh, some, somehow bring more complexity to our industrial uh, base in, in, in house. So with this, we bring more quality jobs. We have uh, more money flowing into the society. So little by little, we start giving hope to uh, our students, our universities. So that, that leave our university and some, sometimes they don't have where to work and we lose a lot of minds to the, to the US and to the rest of the world because of lack of opportunities in-house. But uh, going back to um, how we can implement this thing and uh, what are, the, what are the, the ways forward, I think um, first, establishing fair standards on what is green steel, uh, how can we all talk the same language. This is the first thing in order for us to have an international market for, this, for green commodities. And while establishing a standard, we should not use the standard as a non-tariff barrier, meaning, each country has its own pathways of decarbonizing a certain good. In our case, for example, taking the steel industry as an example, we do have the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen route, which will be very important because 70% more or less of the um, steel installed capacity in Brazil is BF, BOF, so it's a candidate to be uh, refurbished as uh, an HBI producing um, facility. But we also have all the routes with biochar. And uh, this route is very interesting because it used some of the residues, agriculture residues, in order to do the biochar. Not, not only wood, wood also. If it's certified, why not? This, is can also, this can also be carbon neutral or carbon negative. So while certifying, we should, as an international community, not use the standards in order to establish non-tariff barriers 
meaning a preference for certain type of technologies, which means that part of your resources that can be used to decarbonize are just thrown in the, in the thrown away. It's just thrown away because the world doesn't recognize that path as a green one. So I think uh, I'll, I'll finish there. And um, just one, not alert, but just one comment on how this is really important in terms of, the, of the standards. Um, we know that a Brazilian company that is key to the, in the, in the steel industry, I know you, you know what I'm talking about, Vale. Uh, vale signed several MOUs here uh, during COP to um, sell green briquettes which is a lower temperature processes to get from iron ore to a bricket, but it's not HBI itself. And uh, as it's greener, it takes BFBOF to a greener place, but not a carbon neutral place. So again, we see that uh, it's a perpetuation of uh, a technology that, as we are talking here, has to somehow get to another place, which is the uh, hydrogen route. So, uh, it's really important for us to move, to move fast, uh, to understand that somehow the industry will move while we are still discussing. Um, yeah, uh, where to start with just transition? I think uh, we have had a very intense debate on just transition about coal, and a lot of it is about the coal workers and the companies and compensating them. And I think that is mostly fraud because if, if you look at what miners in Europe wor earn, it's, it's usually, I think in Germany, it's more than two times the average salary, right? So they are very well paid. And they are the ones who have most to lose, obviously, but they are not the ones uh, who are actually particularly vulnerable. There are a lot of marginalized people in, in very disadvantaged reg regions in coal. So I think uh, I, I would... Second, what Stressa said about the informal worker. So it's, 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 we need to look beyond the formally employed workers and see informal work, but also the people in the communities who are the women who, who are forced to, li to, to live in very, or, or lead very traditional lives uh, because their hus husbands are working shifts and uh, also bringing in a lot of money and forcing them to to uh, uh, remain homemakers and have no um, uh, economic activities f for themselves. We've seen that a lot in coal, and I think it is pretty similar in steel as well. Um, I think it's with steel, it's much less understood. Uh, there is still a little bit of a hype, I would say, around hydrogen, and everyone is, hey, this is a big opportunity, this is great, we're going to uh, save our regions, all will be good, but I think there are also some cracks forming that we need to study more. Uh, one thing in the U.S., if you look at the electric arc furnaces that are concentrated in the south, they are much less unionized than the blast furnaces in, in, in the north of, of, the, uh, of the U.S. It's probably not like that in Europe so much, but um, that's an interesting thing to study. Um, we kind of always assuming that the steel makers of today will be the steel makers of tomorrow, but I'm questioning that. In Sweden, we have a startup that's supported by venture capital who's going into the market, uh, two startups, yeah. Uh, we've, we're seeing that, uh, that Vale and other uh, mining companies are trying, trying to get hold of that next step of the value chain. And, and also the locations. We've been discussing with Frank uh, the other day uh, that maybe we need to look into other locations in Germany and Europe um, to produce uh, uh, steel. In Germany, for example, it's, it's now in the Ruhr area where we used to have coal. Maybe the better locations are at the coast where we have the wind and uh, can don't have to build so much infrastructure. But if you think about that, we get in, in completely new questions of just transition. There are people who live at the coast who probably don't want to have a steel plant in their backyard. And there are a lot of people in, in, in the rural area and in the regions where we have steel producing today who would lose their jobs. So we have the regional dimension again. I guess for steel and industry decarbonization, we haven't really started in systematically studying these questions, but it's high time. Thank you.
I would ask, uh, Shres has already talked a little bit about giving the Indian perspective, but I know, could you give a very specific on steel? I know you have one, on what actually is one dimension that we don't maybe don't see from Europe. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, India, as I said, is going to double its pr production capacity by 2030. We are at around 150 and we're going to be at 300. Currently, 45% of production in India happens through blast furnace BOF route, but 55% of production happens through, through DRI EAF route, which is the uh, direct reduced iron route. So DRI is the cleanest route around the world, but in India, DRI, 80% of DRI is produced through coal. And these 80% uh, units are basically small and medium scale units and located in different clusters around the country. Uh, and the country is dependent on them. There's a huge market which is dependent on the products they make because India doesn't have as much scrap as the West. So as a replacement of scrap, DRI is important to India. DRI is important to uh, the products they make, the products that go into low-cost housing and different other machineries for small-scale industries. Uh, and the challenge this industry is facing is technological as well. Uh, that currently uh, they run on rotary kilns, which are run on coal, and they have been trying to find a technology which can run on probably natural gas, uh, rotary kiln that can run on natural gas, but natural gas has its own issues in India. Natural gas is not available everywhere, and natural gas is very expensive in India, and the price has been rising like anything over the last years. So uh, it's like a cusp for this huge, huge uh, MSME sector, uh, in steel, because when we talk about steel industry, we are always talking about blast furnaces. CSC did a study last year and found out that out of the, all of the emissions from steel sector in India, 51% of the emissions were from the small scale sectors. So, uh, and they are actually not on the discussion tables at, at times. So this is one challenge that we really, really need to talk about and discuss, and that is where support really needs to flow in be it technological support, be it support for the people working in those industries who are dependent on them, and uh, be it also the finance they would need to transition. I think that is where the real uh, just energy transition lies in the steel sector in India. Okay. <clears throat> yes, thanks a lot, uh, Pat. Very insightful, and I think it's really shown us all your contributions that is not enough to really look in the very big picture, but we really have to look into the detail uh, into the local issues and really find out what's the point and, and where we can adapt. Um, I would like now, we already have discussed one hour, uh, and I would like to open the floor to you here, uh, listening to our discussion, and um, would invite you to bring your insights, your questions to our audience, and we will try to interact with you. And so, uh, please um, go ahead. And I have the first question here. State your name and affiliation if you want to. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Heyun Park. I'm a postdoctoral researcher from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, by myself, my research focuses on climate finance transparency and also I'm interested in decarbonizing in, uh, green steel industries, um, specifically in Sweden and South Korea, where I'm originally from. So I think if you all, like I mentioned, the finance is kind of one of the core issue. But my question is like, what type of financial sources might be appropriate for you know, decarbonizing the industries in terms of just transition. So we all know that this whole story um, shouldn't be like just kind of, you know, um, just kind of same structural, systematic kind of, systematical kind of inequality issues like a loan-based uh, relationships, right? So I just wonder where we can mobilize, uh, what type of sources, so yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you, very important point. Um, I'm not looking, I'm just looking, uh, Lucas, you want to make a point or part you? I, I've, yeah. I would suggest to go, get in touch with my colleague Karsing, who is basically sitting next to you, who is working on climate finance questions. <laughs> and we, we actually thought about how financial, or started to think about how a financial mechanism for, for, for a climate club could come from. Uh, I don't think you will have an answer at the moment, but it's some, something that, that uh, we need to work on. At, in the Climate Club so far, I think it's a matchmaking platform of existing funds. I don't see that there is uh, much coming in. I do think that there is, in 
theory, also some uh, uh, private sector interest in buying green steel. If there is a robust certification scheme and a robust design, the automotive industry has been particularly interested in, in, in buying um, green steel. That's what they're saying. I don't know how much they are willing to pay, actually. That's something that we will have to figure out once we have a market. But um, yeah, uh, a research question. Thanks. <laughs> So, um, I see Rosanna and Pat both okay. nodding, so. So, uh, I think I'm not a finance expert, to be true, but, uh, so there, there would be different sources for different applications, I think. So the larger companies, uh, like, which are working on blast furnaces, really require certain pilots, and that could come up with, you know, uh, partnerships with companies which are already doing it, probably in the West, uh, which is already happening at some scale. Uh, but yes, even they in India are facing a lot of challenge in getting more finances for their uh, green technology projects. Now, when you talk about the small scale sector, it becomes even tougher because already there's so much perceived risks assigned to these finance flows. I think the MDBs can really play a big role over there. Uh, and I. I think uh, they really need, to, because if they come in, uh, it really uh, reduces the risk perception for, for a certain sector. And uh, I think I wouldn't comment beyond that because uh, that's what I think, because MDBs can really play a big role in reducing the risk, especially for the small and medium scale sectors. And of course, the governments need to play a role over there. Mm, okay, your Sorry. question really has, has raised lots of interest. I would first like to uh, ask Shrestha. She, May I? And May then I just add one? Also, stress that to the, to the question. But then you sure, come and then talk. Lucas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to... Uh, so I think, you know, this financing question is interesting because, um, because there can be three. And looking at countries like India, I think here private investments will play a big role. And um, India's steel sector has some of the very key players when there are many private firms, uh, companies which are there, which are big, which are rich. Uh, so private investment will be key. And therefore, one of the key things for the steel sector will be enterprise level transition planning and enterprise level investment, almost like something we look, you know, in India also for the automobile sector. The second important thing will be, and which Parth uh, uh, somewhat mentioned, will be MDBs. And uh, recently, for example, the Asian Development Bank is currently trying to come up with a just energy transition financing platform, uh, looking into uh, how MDBs can enhance their financing ambition, not just for technology transfer or uh, phase out, but also to um, you know support some of the just elements of it, which is the workforce transition, uh, revitalizing the economy and all of that. And third thing, I think once you know, the public financing from the government should help to unleash the scope of private investments. That's what will be the role of the governments in this financing, because clearly governments will not be able to support this kinds of financing necessary. But what they can do is create the ecosystem for private uh, financers or private institutions to come in. So uh, these are the three points I just wanted to highlight. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Very precise and, and to the point. Rosanna, you also wanted to add. Yeah, I'll try to be as precise and to the point. Um, given that, let's a hypothet hypothetical situation where you do have the demand, meaning someone wanting to buy your green product or your green steel, and all the standards are there in order to de-risk the whole thing. So supply and demand are talking the same thing. This is a hypothetical world still, but let's say this is a given. Then uh, there, there is still the question of who pays for the green premium. Because of course the green good will cost a little bit more or much more or I don't know how many percent more of, uh, than the, the normal thing. So this gap will be bridged by several instruments. Carbon market is one of them. Um, the one that is buying may be willing to pay a little bit more. Then you have some fiscal incentives, tariffs incentives, I don't know. And then there is the financing that has to help bridge part of this gap. 
This financing will be for sure something like a blended finance, at least for our country makes total sense, something like a blended finance that you can offer the one that is, in, for example, willing to invest to get a BF, BOF facility to be a hydrogen one or any other uh, technology. So the financing cost, the cost of this money has to be lower than market and long term. So, and this is exactly what we use to boost the wind energy industry in Brazil. So from 2009 to, 2000 to now, we installed 35 gigawatts of fin entirely financed by uh, the Brazilian money. So if we do have all the things in place and we have a lower cost, long-term uh, money there, then the private banks can come with the short-term money and they, the, the whole arrangement works. So I, this is more or less my thoughts. If you want to go deeper in this, uh, I'm, after the panel, I'm willing to discuss BNDS has already a plan on that, okay, which is the Brazilian Development Bank. Okay, great. Lucas, you also want to yeah, add? Just, just a very quick reaction to Paz. Um, I think it will be very hard to convince the German or any European government to provide public funding to support the very large steelmakers like JSW, Tata, Arcelor. And also it will be hard to support the Indian state-owned companies. But it might be a different yeah. story when we look into the small and medium in, uh, industries because A, there is the need is much more clear. B, they're serving local markets. They're not in competition with the German and the European steelmakers. So I think here is an entry point uh, that, that, that might, uh, where we might work with, uh, with, with government and tell them this is the, the, this is the, the thing you need to fund and, and have at least some public, public money available. Okay, yes, thank you. So thanks very much for this great question, sparking such a big discussion here. Um, but the invitation is open to everybody. Um, do you have more questions, please? Uh, there some. Uh, thank you very much for fascinating uh, discussion. My name is Toshi Sakamoto uh, from Institute of Energy Economics Japan, IEJ. Uh, we are closely working with the Buddha Fowl uh, Institute. Um, if I may, I would like to make a comment to the first presentation, even though the gentleman is not here <laughs> anymore. Uh, he seems to be optimistic, saying that the steel is not necessarily hard to abate. I, but I slightly disagree with that. I'm not a steel industry expert, but recently the Japanese government published a net zero roadmap for steel industry, which said the carbon intensity of steel product will only start to significantly reduce around 2040 when direct hydrogen technology, direct hydrogen reduction technology will start to be deployed. Um, the, the steel industry in Japan are you know, working hard to develop the new technologies, uh, high, high, direct hydrogen reduction technologies with support of the Japanese government. But you know, the, if hydrogen is used, H2O is produced, which will reduce the temperature of the furnace. And the hydrogen needs to be supplied from outside, which has to be very cheap. Uh, one of the industry people said it has to be as cheap as 50 cents per hydrogen kilogram. You know, and also uh, iron ore needs to be high quality. You know, all these things need to be overcome. So, you know, I think steel is still uh, hard to abate. Okay. Uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, I, I think that's uh, very much in line. And next, shall we shall take the gentleman over here Maybe. now, and then you can answer both of them. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, I think that each country should carry out your proper pathway for decarbonization. And today, Brazil is having a technology developing in hydrogen production. I'm talking about the ethanol steam reforming. And uh, today, the hydrogen production is coming from fossil fuels. Maybe, you know, 90% uh, or 
84% is coming from uh, methane. Uh, when I'm talking about, oh, I see the presentation, uh, the cost is very influenced, or strongly influenced by, by the hydrogen price or hydrogen cost. And the, the question is, what is the urgent or the emergency point to the, the carbonization? Because the hydrogen cost is very high. And we are talking about today, we don't have green hydrogen. <laughs> uh, this is a, a challenge to, to decarbonization. The other part is if we without uh, have hydrogen, green hydrogen. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, what is the main point to start uh, today in the in the carbonization process of this in this industry? So th thanks a lot for these questions and uh, um, yeah, I, uh, highlighting both the question and the comment, uh, some of the challenges which also lie in in the energy system, of course, and so. Uh, maybe you can also add on what, what such a corporation can do for, for mitigating the challenges which are definitely there, if we call it hard to abate or not, uh, definitely they are there. So, someone? I, yes, please, Rosanna. I'll, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but as you well know, we, are, we have uh, wind resources with 55% capacity factor, solar resource with 30 something capacity factor so we are able to get a hydrogen as low as three dollars without subsidies so we have to get from there to two or to one and a half which is uh, in terms of subsidy is less than what Europe has to subsidize and what the US is doing with IRA so Probably we will be in a position in Brazil to get to the 1.5 in an easier way than uh, other countries. But if we position ourselves only to export hydrogen to Japan, uh, as you well mentioned, this is not sustainable, um, then we will not develop our own industry and we will ne never get to where it's needed to our own domestic use of hydrogen. And yeah, I know why you ask, because you are working on ethanol, on hydrogen from, from ethanol. So all the routes have to come to this 1.5, and how are we going to do that? Uh, we have to have a combination of finance, bridging the gap uh, from gray hydrogen to green hydrogen and this green hydrogen has to bring value to the societies this is where the money is coming from to subsidize green hydrogen i don't like the color scheme anymore so i like the low emissions hydrogen but for the sake of the answer to bring this green hydrogen to the price point where it should be we need scale and we won't have scale if we do not bring value to the our society by using this hydrogen domestically to decarbonize our industry and with some financing to export this green product to somewhere else. So um, this is a chicken and egg thing. We have to bring to break this egg and make a chicken of it. I would, yeah. yes. Please, so uh, telling you from an India perspective how we are seeing hydrogen, so the government has taken its initiative. We have a national hydrogen mission in place. We have set a target of 5.5 million tons of hydrogen production by 2030. Currently, we are not producing any green hydrogen or there would be some pilots in the pipeline. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of work to be done on the ground, be it the infrastructure, be it the renewable energy capacity, added renewable energy capacity we would require to produce hydrogen. Uh, although I think the power ministry has considered that in their latest plan as well. Uh, but yes, uh, the transportation, the application, uh, I'm sure what Sweden is doing or other companies which are doing as a pilot will really help, can really help uh, countries like India and Brazil to understand that. But uh, yes, uh, to scale up, I think there is some time. Uh, it might take time, uh, but we all want to be optimistic and it would be good as soon as it happens. But that's true uh, that currently uh, there's very less movement on the ground. But yeah, the policy framework is being made ready and uh, hopefully things will move soon. And 
just a news here. Uh, it was approved by the Congress at the lower chamber, the Brazilian na uh, the National Hydrogen Plan. It's a bill that passed the lower chamber just to give the grounds for the, the low emissions hydrogen plan in Brazil. So, and there is a, a, already about 20 gigawatts of projects of electrolyzers being developed there. So it's moving, perhaps not fast enough, but it's moving. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. Very impressive. Um, I think we have another question over there. Please state uh, your name yes, and please. affiliation. Hi everyone, I'm Ifwa from Ghana. I work with the Green Africa Youth Organization. Um, when we were talking, I want to highlight that uh, we are saying the just transition. Every party should do it in its, in its own pathway towards a just transition. When you mentioned that um, maybe there will be measures and standards set in place, for instance, governing the steel industry, how do you think that won't affect maybe a company and maybe Ghana, um, a steel factory in Ghana, if you are saying everybody should develop in their own way towards a just transition and their measures globally, won't that affect the way countries transition? Okay, so thank you. Who, who has an idea? Who wants Lucas? Yeah. yeah. Shrestha, you as well, later? Yeah, I think. Um, so the, the standards that are currently being discussed are the question is uh, how much embedded carbon can we still accept to call it green steel and qualify for green premium markets? That's the basic question. And then the detailed question here is, is uh, to also square this with different scrap uh, content, uh, right? Because it's, it's much less energy intensive to produce recycled steel from scrap but there is only so much scrap available, we will need virgin steel. I don't think it will, um, well, at least that's currently not, no one is really discussing whether uh, any downstream products that use steel will be somehow uh, uh, yeah, um, judged or, or, or limited, regulated on that foundation. Maybe in the car industry, there, there is kind of the idea to, at the, at the moment um, in the EU, you have these fleet standards that you have to have maximum um, uh, CO2 emissions per kilometer. But if we all switch to renewable or electric vehicles, at some point it might be very pl plausible that they start also considering the embedded emissions. But I don't think that's a really a challenge for, for uh, Africa in the moment. On the other hand, we've been working a lot with, um, with South African colleagues who are also in a unique position to uh, start this, this uh, DRI trade uh, version and revive their own industry and also maybe then that support with that their own automotive industry. At the moment, the, uh, the, the South African uh, automotive industry is not using South African steel. So th there is... Uh, <laughs> There, there is also a lot of opportunity. Guinea uh, has just discovered very large um, reserves for iron ore, which I think Chinese companies, f first and foremost, are trying to develop. If I could uh, have a say in that, I would probably ask them to start, n not build a blast, or build, build a DRI plant, export the DRI, and don't just export the, uh, the, the, the ore to... to uh, China or build a blast furnace in uh, in Guinea. So, I I would hope that there is a lot more opportunity than than danger with with that. Um, at, yeah, I don't know how it will play down in 20, 30 years. Th there, then there might be a, a, a way to basically limit imports or or, or, or um, forbid the the use or the entry into market of very high carbon steels as a standard. But we are not there. That's that's long down the road. Yeah, although the EU is preparing policy instruments. I think I asked Stressa also to comment. Stressa, do you want to uh, um, give also some insights to this question or, or not? Uh, I'm so sorry. You know, there was some interruption, so I could not hear her question very clearly. If someone can repeat, I can see if I have anything to add to what Lucas said. I think, um, the, I think I still have that interruption. Maybe it's not very clear. The, do, you hear, do you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you clearly, yeah. Okay, so the question was whether the standard setting, I'm not sure I'm doing justice to your question, but uh, whether the standard setting would also affect countries like Ghana and Africa uh, and limit, for, basically force a transformation pathway on them that they don't, wouldn't maybe choose for themselves without these standards? Yeah, I'm, I don't think, Lucas, I have much to add to actually what I have said. Yeah, yeah. Let's not, uh, we can take more questions. Maybe. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of oh, sorry. We can so, pass maybe briefly, and then we have time for one last question, and okay. then we are also approaching the end of this panel. So, uh, yeah, very briefly, just to add a point that uh, India is defining its green steel currently. And uh, standard setting is very important at a global level, but it is also important to understand that uh, the whole world cannot follow a single standard of green steel. Different countries are having different trajectories. So I think we should more focus on the methodology, how to measure the carbon footprint of steel and the embodied carbon, and then respect the different trajectories of the different countries. And probably, because it, it is just very tough to have a single standard, and if it's a very high standard, a lot of countries will be left out of the loop. This is so. it. And in the end, it boils down to some industrial policy via standards. Mm -hmm. We have one last question over there um, yeah. before we wrap up our meeting. Yeah, I'm Joseph Delatte. I'm in charge of climate and decarbonization policy at Institut Montaigne, uh, France's largest think tank. Uh, I, I do, we don't have a lot of time. I just wanted to, 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 to maybe develop a little bit on the challenge of, for hydrogen development, which, which uh, one of the key issues we face at the moment is also the quality of electrolyzer. We don't reach high quality enough, like the, the, the charge needs still to be developed when you discuss with the, with the extremely uh, most advanced uh, companies building this electrolyzer. They are all aware that they still need to develop this electrolyzer in order to reach uh, the quality we need to, to to develop the real supply. So I think we, we, should, we should keep that into consideration when we discuss industry decarbonization because this might actually influence uh, the, the timeline uh, achievable uh, for, for, for the cheapest option possible for industry decarbonization. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last, one, one real question then <laughs> about the green premium. Uh, I was wondering whether you, we could discuss CFDs because maybe this is also uh, yeah. one, key, yeah. one key thing uh, for, for the future of the steel industry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, may I start on electrolyzers? Sure. Yes, true. Um, before talking about electrolyzer, I just want to remind these electrolyzers is not the only way to get to uh, low emissions hydrogen. So the guy that is sitting here is developing from ethanol. I know his research, that's why I'm pointing him out. Um, and also, and also, um, if you really need uh, low emissions hydrogen, like for now, you just do like reform or biomethane. It's actually the same process as reforming, uh, reforming biogas. Perhaps in the thermodynamical world is not the best, but if you need low emissions hydrogen for now, just start with that. And then you can develop your electrolyzers. And then going into the electrolyzers, there is another discussion. One is the efficiency of the electrolyzers. And the second is, OK, you are supplying your electrolyzer with uh, renewable energy, which is intermittent. So someone has to stabilize this, uh, this electricity. We do have a grid that is 92% uh, renewables. And I can stabilize your uh, electrolyzer the um, production curve with uh, my grid, but places where you need a huge amount of batteries, then lithium comes into place. And the uh, lithium mining is another issue. So it's several layers of reflections that we have to have in order first to understand that green or low emissions carbon come only from electrolyzers. This serves only for the ones wanting to sell electrolyzers, which is not bad in itself, but it's not enough. The world will need uh, hydrogen in large amounts. Other technologies have to come into place. Okay, yeah, thank you for reminding us that's also a technical issue, of course, this transformation. Um, yes. As we are now approaching the end, Max, uh, do you have some 
last. No, I think this was a very well. No, yes, I have. <laughs> uh, I think it was a very interesting debate here. Uh, I think what I would take home is mostly that yes, international cooperation is good, but would always look different if you take it from another country's perspective and understand what actually are the challenges and not just sort of theorizing over what ought to be the challenges. Uh, and I think that we have learned. It's a very sort of give and take kind of position we need to have. And by that, I have a lot of comments. It came to, it was about to be the hard to debate. It came to do a lot about steel. I have a lot of comments on the steel comments, uh, but we'll be here and I can talk with anyone who wants to know more about steel in that case. But Stefan, should we say thank you now? Absolutely. Um, yes, it's really Stefan, important to talk to each other because it's really can I different. Just, just add Rosanna? one single word is on COP30 in Berlin. Sorry? Uh, can I just add one single word? It's on COP30 that will be in Berlin, in Brazil. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what we are proposing as E+, is that as we had in the past, the, con, con, uh, the 89 agreement that set up the economy and our life for the past years, we are proposing that at COP, we reach out to a consensus, which is called the consensus of Belém, that is exactly what we are discussing here in this mm -hmm. panel. Yes, thank you. So. Thank you all for being here, for discussing this important topic for our panelists, particularly for Shrestha from, from India to Frank, who already had to leave. Very special and big thanks to all the colleagues over there from the UNFCCC making this perfect uh, possible here. Thanks a lot to everybody and see you all back in COP30 at least in Berlin. Thank you.